Okay, so I was asked to speak about elliptic curves in a post-quantum session. That doesn't look too good. Um, so before we get into this, let's forget about quantum computers for a minute. Um, and let's admire the awesomeness of elliptic curves uh, in cryptography. <laughs> um, yeah, I know there are still some haters out there, so some people still say, what have elliptic curves ever done for us? And for those guys, I have the following slide. So these are all the awesome things we can do with elliptic curves, factoring, primality, proving. We have simple and fast key exchange and digital signatures, so we have ECDHE, ECDSA, X25519, we have AddDSA, and even very modern things with funny names like 4Q and SchnorQ. And all this comes with very small and compact parameters. Um, so yeah, due to the availability of generic attacks only. And not to forget pairings, right? These are the only practical multilinear maps we have. Um, they brought a lot of nice applications. And yeah, all these things are very awesome. So unlike in the RSA setting in elliptic curves, we fix specific parameters. So we have a set of fixed specific curves. Um, you might recognize some of those. So here are two sets. Uh, of curves that are widely used these days, and those two sets come from quite different selection processes. So the first ones are the NIST curves with all their P's, and no, 521 is not a typo. Um, and then the second set is uh, curve 25519 and curve 448. Those have been recommended by the IRTF for use in TLS 1.3. Um, well, yes, there are some trust issues with some of those curves because there's a perception that these four-letter institutions were inappropriately influenced by some three-letter entities <laughs> like uh, NSA or DJB. <clears throat> <laughs> well, anyway, these are the curves that many of you know and that are used uh, in the wild. And now let's take a look at something completely different. So this is some other elliptic curve. And if you take a look at this prime, it's first of all really large, it has 751 bits, um, and it doesn't look quite like the primes we know from these other curves on the previous slide. So it's not close to a power of two, like 25519, it's actually close to a power of two times a power of three. And then this curve, uh, given here, is actually defined over a prime field FP, but we'll take a look at it over the quadratic extension field because everything happens in that universe over FP squared that is interesting for us. So this curve is super singular, um, and its group order is smooth. You can see it down there. So over FP, it's actually P plus one, and over FP squared, it's P plus one squared. And this curve is really bad for ECC. Right. The main reasons are it's super singular and it has a smooth group order. So the smooth group order makes sure we can easily solve uh, DLPs in any subgroup and easily means in a matter of milliseconds. And also, uh, because it's super singular, we have the whale pairing that is actually a multiplicative transfer of the discrete logarithm from the curve to a finite field. And in this case, it's really FP squared. So the DLP even becomes easier if you move it over to this finite field. So this curve fails most criteria for being a secure uh, curve for traditional ECC. But maybe we can use these other um, properties in a different context. So one of these properties is that this curve has a really large number of subgroups. So if you just take a look at the set of points which have a specific order, so all the orders that divide two to the 372, um, this group of points can be generated by two points. 
and you can easily generate any point in there by taking scale, uh, linear combinations with these scalars MA and NA as shown here. And if you count the number of such subgroups that have full order, and you can easily generate those by making sure that one of these uh, coefficients is odd. Um, then you will see there are a lot of these subgroups, namely 3 times 2 to the 371. So we have a huge set of subgroups, and we might get the idea to take these as secret keys, right? We can easily generate them. And um, you might notice I put the subscripts A here, so I'm going to assign this torsion group to Alice. So Alice now has this large set and can choose secret points for her subgroups. And then the same holds for the three power torsion. Just analogously, uh, the same happens. And I'm going to assign this to Bob. So Bob has this universe of uh, subgroups here he can choose from. Um, and now I have to, at some point, have to mention the word isogenies, right? So what is the connection there? So from these subgroups, we can uh, come up with isogenies. So what is an isogeny is actually just a map between two elliptic curves. Uh, it's a rational map. So these are the natural maps that exist between elliptic curves. And you can think of those as just fractions of polynomials in the coefficients of the points you're mapping. Um, and there's an additional condition here for being an isogeny, which is that it is a group homomorphism. And then this correspondence between the finite subgroups and an isogeny is given via the kernel. So all these elements that map to zero or to the neutral element on the elliptic curve um, by this map, that's a subgroup. And if you start out with such a subgroup, you will get an isogeny from it with that kernel. Actually, there's a unique second curve and a map between those uh, up to isomorphism. Um, and we were, we're going to write this uh, curve E2 as E1 modulo G modulo this subgroup. And then there's something that's called the degree of the isogeny, which is almost what you think it is. It's sort of the degree of the polynomials involved. But in the case that's interesting for us, it's also the number of elements in this subgroup. So what this gives us is we, we start out with this huge set of subgroups and they had a large order, right? So what, what we get from this is isogenies with a very large degree. And OK, what can we do with those? So we can start on a certain curve, maybe the one I started out with. And then we can walk uh, and can map isogenies to other curves. And actually, what we're doing is we walk in a certain graph. And that is the uh, super singular isogeny graph. So the vertices are all the curves that you can reach by isogenies from a certain starting point um, over fp squared. And it turns out there are quite a few. So there are p over 12 such curves. So we have, we have also a very large set of these isogenous curves. So they all have the same group order. So if we start with the one I gave you, in the beginning, then all these other curves we end up on have the same structure. They have this uh, torsion in the same way uh, as the starting curve. And then the edges, so now oh, I, I used my artistic skills to put some uh, curves here. Think about these as the isomorphism classes. And there are more curves outside the slide. And now we, we're going to draw edges, but I'm not going to draw the, these high degree isogenies only prime degree isogeny. So here are two isogenies. And it turns out this graph is connected and three regular. So every node has three um, edges here. There can be loops and double edges. Um, but this is how a generic part of that graph should look. And then if you take the three graph instead, so now we're not drawing two isogenies, but we're drawing three isogenies. It becomes a four regular graph. So you get more edges. And you might notice that um, things that were connected before now might not be connected. And things that are close here might be far away in the three graphs. So we have the same set of nodes, but we can walk through it in a different way, depending on whether we take the two or the three isogenies. OK, so now I have to start talking about how we actually compute this stuff. So that's an operation we want to use. 
So we want to choose these secret keys, we want to come up with the isogenies, and we want to actually compute the isogenies. So there are formulas, uh, values formulas, allow you to take a kernel subgroup and come up with the isogeny, come up with formulas that allow you to map points between curves. The problem is the costs for this is uh, proportional to the size of the subgroup. So if you think back to these large subgroups, there's no way we can actually do this large isogeny in one go. But luckily we chose uh, the degree to be smooth. So we can really walk through the graph in little steps. For example, in the two isogeny graph, we walk through it with two isogenies. Um, so here's one example. Uh, if we take this one point of this order, then we can decompose it into 372 two isogenies. And I just wrote down the first one down there. What you do is you take this point R naught, you do a scalar multiplication by the factor of 2 to the 371, and what that gives you is a point of order 2, which lies in this kernel, and itself generates a small uh, order 2 subgroup, which you can use with the formulas to compute this little first 2 isogeny. And then you map everything to the new curve, and you keep on going. So the next one, you'll take the point R1, do a scalar multiplication to generate a point of order 2, and then you can do the next step, the, the little 2 isogeny phi 1. So now we have these operations. Uh, we have all our secrets, which are subgroups. We get isogenies, and we have this operation. And we can take a look at how we would try to come up with a Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange from that. So um, here's a comparison between, you have seen this already in the previous uh, talk, a recall of the standard Diffie-Hellman uh, settings. So the original one was integers modular prime. Your secrets were exponents. The computation is just an exponentiation. And the hard problem is the discrete log problem, modulo p. Then on elliptic curves, the classical case, you're working on a group of points. Do a scalar multiplication, k times p, and again, the discrete log on the elliptic curve. But now for the isogeny case, um, we work on this class of isogenous curves, so this graph. And secrets are isogenies. And the operation is taking a curve and applying the isogeny, coming up with the second curve. So a little more detail here, how would that look? So E is the curve from the start. Um, now Alice and Bob both go ahead and select their secret subgroup by picking these scalars, M and N, in their respective cases. And then just doing what I told you, just walk to the other curve in the graph. Now these red um, curves, they are the public keys. They are public information. They sent them to the other party. And now they somehow need to complete this diagram. They sort of need to arrive at a common curve that we can take as the shared key. And for this uh, to be possible in this setting, we need some more information. So we have to extend the public keys by the images of the generator points under the secret isogeny. So what um, Alice will do, she will send phi A of PB and phi A of QB as well. So why is that? So what Bob can do now is compute the image of his secret point R under Alice's secret isogeny. By just doing the same operation uh, he did to come up with R, now on these images, and because this is a group homomorphism, this will be the image of the secret point. So this is just a way to make sure that a similar operation now can be done on Alice's public key, right? And vice versa, so now we can arrive at this uh, shared secret curve E mod R comma S. Okay, so how, let's start thinking about parameters and sizes and timings. So how large are these keys? they can actually be represented with just 564 bytes. So essentially you could take three x-coordinates uh, over fp squared, 
Um, so basically, three FP squared elements uh, will allow you to, gener uh, to represent this, and this is 564 bits. So compared to what we saw in the, in the previous talk, and even the, the one before, this is still quite a bit smaller than the lattice-based schemes, even the ring learning with errors, which had around um, two kilobytes, right, per direction. Or the new ones, Tancred introduced shorter, but still one kilobyte. All right, so it's really, sh really small, but unfortunately I have to disappoint you, Lera. No update. It's still as slow as um, it was. So these are timings in millions of cycles. So the total is around 56 milliseconds on this machine. And yeah, it is a bit slow, right? So compared to the to lettuce stuff, that's definitely not competitive yet. If you really need the size, if you really need to have small keys, then that might be an option. But hopefully people can speed this up. <clears throat> so if you want to look at the code, we have a, uh, we have released the code under the link shown here, um, and you can just take it and play around. So what about security? Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of uh, problems related to this key exchange. As usual, I just put the overarching super singular isogeny problem here that, is, that corresponds to the discrete log problem for the other cases. So the problem is you're given two curves, E1 and E2, over FP squared, and you know there's an isogeny between them of a certain fixed and smooth degree. And now giving those two curves together with two points and their images find the isogeny. So in terms of attacks, um, so it seems, it, it, so this is not really a very a general isogeny problem, right? If you would take two random curves in that class, you're not guaranteed that they're connected by a isogeny of this specific degree. So that's an additional condition here. And that means also, because this is a bit shorter than you would usually expect, um, this means that the best attacks we know are actually attacks uh, via a standard generic claw finding algorithm. So you would start from both ends, build up trees of isogenies, and then find a match in the middle, right? And it turns out, yeah, the classical uh, complexity is O of P over to the one-fourth, and the quantum attack is O of P to the one-sixth. Um, and for these, these attacks, these algorithms are uh, optimal. So we, we um, think this has uh, post-quantum security roughly 125 bits. All right. So we do have uh, this key exchange now, which, is, which produces pretty small public keys, um, but it's slow. So let's make the keys even smaller and the protocol even slower. Um, <laughs> We can do something to keys to compress them even further. And this relates to what I said on the, one of the first few slides that this curve is actually really bad for traditional ECC because it has, the DLPs can be solved easily and it has a pairing. And now we're going to use these things in a constructive way. Namely, it is way better to represent points not by their co coordinates but by these scalars. Um, that were used to generate them. Or in this case, I mean, we, we will be mapped to this curve, so they weren't generated, but we can, they are representable by uh, the two scalars in a certain basis of the torsion group, right? But for that, we need to solve discrete logs. But we can do it in milliseconds, so we can actually just solve them and come up with these scalars. So what does that mean? As I mentioned, the original public key is uh, three FP squared elements, which is six log P um, bits. And that was the number we saw, 564 bytes. But now we can replace both of these points by their scalars in the decomposition, uh, by the dis discrete logs. Um, and we can even normalize by one. So there's definitely one among the four that can be inverted modulo the order. So we can just uh, get rid of one and only have three um, elements of size two to the 372. 
So that comes down to 7 over 2 log p, and which is 330 bytes in the setting I showed. So what do we have to do for this to happen? So we, ha we get this public key, these points. First of all, because this curve we're working on is a random curve we just came up with during the key exchange, right? So we, we chose this path, we walked there, and then we have the curve equation. Now we first need to come up with a basis for the torsion group. So we need to deterministically compute a basis because the, the person who will um, decompress will need to use the same basis. And then we can even use the pairings. We map everything over to the finite field fp squared, and then we can simultaneously solve these discrete logs for these coefficients. And the cost, well, it is fast, but it costs as much as about one whole key exchange, so pretty slow in total. All right, the last thing I'd like to mention is there's a problem if you want to use this in a static setting. So there are similar problems for the lattice-based schemes. Uh, it seems that is somehow inherent to some of these post-quantum candidates. Um, and here in the isogeny setting, it has to do with these points we give out, actually. So assume we have a slightly simplified setting here. The first scalar is one in Alice's public key. Uh, static key, secret. <laughs> um, and then imagine Bob and Alice do this protocol and Bob behaves uh, honestly until a certain point when he has to send his public key. So he computes these images of Alice's points, but he doesn't send the original public key. He slightly modifies the second point by adding this multiple of the first point. And then he goes on and does the rest of the protocol honestly. So he will come up with the honest shared secret in the end, which is really the curve that comes from the subgroup on the left down here. But Alice, when she uses the public key that Bob sent her, she will compute the point on the right. So she has this additional term in there. And it turns out that those two groups are the same exactly when the least significant bit of and A is zero. So Bob now can use Alice as an oracle. He can try to connect. If he can, if the connection works, then the bit must have been zero. If not, it was one. So yeah, this allows Bob to just get at the least significant bit. And there's a slightly more complicated way, but as simple um, to get the other bits. So with a sort of, yeah, N connections here, Bob can reconstruct Alice's secret key. Um, there is a countermeasure to this, but the countermeasure is uh, basically the Fujisaki Okamoto transform, which means Alice would have to recompute everything that Bob did, and the cost for that would be more than to do, a, do an ephemeral uh, key exchange in the first place. So it doesn't really make sense to do static here at this point. Um, Okay, so let me end with, in the interest of keeping elliptic curves in cryptography, please help by taking another look at isogeny-based crypto. Yeah? So cryptanalysis is a bit understudied, I think. So we need people that really want to break this. And um, we need people to speed it up. It is too slow, as you have seen. So we sh would need an order or two of magnitude to get there. Um, and then there are some open problems like uh, public key validation that doesn't allow these static uh, attacks. And in terms of signatures, the only thing we have right now is applying the fiat Shamir transform to an identification protocol, and it's quite inefficient. Um, so this talk was uh, mainly about people's, uh, other people's work. So um, I just put the most uh, immediate references here. Those are a good start to find all the people that were involved in all this work. And I'm done, thank you. Right, thanks.
Great. Any, any questions? We have time for a question or two. Ah, so why don't I ask a question? So, um, um, right, so there's a generalization of, of elliptic curves called higher genus curves, uh, uh, hyper, hyper, uh, you know, hyperelliptic mm -hmm. and such. How do these things behave in those kind of environments? It's all very much more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so stay away. <laughs> okay. All right. Good, good, okay. But this is a very reasonable, this is a viable alternative for uh, bandwidth constraints environments. Great. Okay, so uh, let's thank uh, uh, Michael again. Thanks.